So here we are with a topic that could have been separated out as an extension topic because I didn't see either of the two things we're going to talk about in this movie explicitly mentioned in the WJEC specs. If I'm wrong and they were there, well, you should be studying them anyway. If I'm not wrong and not in the specs, nothing wrong with doing a little bit further anyway, especially as both of these topics I'm going to discuss are rather important chemically. Now, first thing I'm going to talk about is we're going to look at the nucleophile itself. We talked, and I know your specs talk fairly extensively, about the alkyl halide involved in the reaction. You talk about the strength of the carbon-halogen bond, how easily the halogens can leave. So we talk about the leaving group, right? Iodine is the best leaving group to the extent we've discussed so far, because in this conditions, it has the weakest carbon halogen bond. We also talked about the nature of the um, carbon itself. How many things is it bonded to? The smaller the things that it's bonded to, the easier it is for the nucleophile to attack from the backside. So that was why the methyl halides much better than the primary, much better than the secondary, and tertiary halides don't even do SN2 reactions. So that was one of the reactants, the alkyl halide itself. But what about the other reactant, the nucleophile? Well, there is a wide range in the quality of nucleophiles. There is a wide range in how much a nucleophile actually likes positives, the so-called nucleophilicity. And it's worth a couple of minutes just talking about relative nucleophilicities. I've divided the nucleophiles into four categories. We start off with the poor nucleophiles, methanol, water. Um, these are solvents, and so a lot of times you will find you can do solvolysis reactions in which the actual solvent acts as a nucleophile to the alkyl halide. Okay, But if you've got some good nucleophiles in there, then you'll have the nucleophilic attack rather than the solvolysis, because while methanol and water can attack, because of course those oxygens have lone pairs, they're not very good at it. They don't have a very high nucleophilicity. Now the numbers we're using here are the relative rates of the reaction. So if all else is equal, a water reaction will happen three times as fast as a methanol reaction. Now nitrate, nitrate of course you can think of as being a nucleophile because it's an anion, it's got those electrons there that it could do things with. And indeed you might say, oh, nitrate's 30 times faster than methanol. Well, as we'll see in a minute, 30 is not a very impressive number under these conditions. Nitrate is generally a pretty stable anion. We'll talk about it in the acid base module about how nitrate in terms of acidity and basicity is a spectator ion. Nitrate's just happy to be there. It's kind of like the anionic equivalent of sodium plus or K plus, right? They're just really happy, stable ions. Anyway, those are the poor nucleophiles. Now we'll move to the fair nucleophiles. And you can see already we're moving up into the hundreds and the thousands compared to methanol. Again, emphasizing the fact that nitrate is a pretty poor. Now we've got fluoride in here. Fluoride's an anion. It can be a nucleophile, but it's not a very good one. And we've got acetate. Again, can be a uh, nucleophile and indeed um, as we talked in the original screen, you can use these type anions in order to make esters. Okay, chloride, you can uh, take a fluoride, for example, and turn it into a chloride if you're very, very careful. All of these you would expect to be nucleophiles because they're anions. There's ammonia, it's a nucleophile because it has a lone pair. And you see ammonia is a thousand times better than water in terms of being a nucleophile. These are the fair nucleophiles. Now we've got the good ones. So here you can see the hydroxide, we already discussed, 80,000 times better than methanol. There's bromide, nice nucleophile itself. So bromide can leave, bromide can attack quite happily. Cyanide, we mentioned earlier, really important um, synthetic reagent that we'll talk about much later modules. There is an alkoxide, something we'll talk about when we get to the alcohols, very, very good nucleophiles. Okay, and then finally, here are the absolutely super duper ones. You can see we've got millions, tens of millions greater than methanol. 
iodine, as we said, um, the iodo halides, right, um, or the iodo alkanes, I should say, the alkyl halides react very, very well. Well, iodide is also a lovely nucleophile. So in other words, if you've got, say, an alkyl chloride that will do reactions okay, you can actually turn it into an alkyl iodide very easily, which then, of course, does further reactions much more nicely. And then here are a couple of sulfur containing ones that we're not really going to talk too much about sulfur containing or organic compounds that contain sulfur, but it's important to know that they are an important type of organic compound. So anyway, nucleophilicity, um, have at least a feel for these trends. Generally, anions better than neutral molecules. In terms of the halogens, the bigger the halogen gets, the better the nucleophile it is. And then sulfur, better than oxygen nucleophiles. That's the HS minus compared to the OH minus. Cyanide, very nice nucleophile. Azide, very nice nucleophile. And so on. The other topic that I believe is an extension for A-level material, but is not an extension for what we do in this particular course, is associated with getting some evidence of the backside attack. Um, we've had indirect evidence by the fact that primary alkyl is better than secondary and tertiary just don't do SN2 reactions, um, which implies that the, the more stuff you get around the carbon, the harder it is for that nucleophile to get in, which implies that it's a backside attack. But that's not absolute evidence. What is outstanding evidence is the so-called configuration inversion that is observed when you do one of these reactions. Now that's a fancy phrase with lots of syllables that can put people off, but essentially it's saying if you have an optically active compound like this one here, the 2-chloro-3-methylbutane, then you can look at what happens to its enantiomers as it does the reaction. Now, because I'm going to be focusing on what's happening at this carbon here, let's abbreviate what we've got on this carbon. Okay, if we look at it, the carbon's got a hydrogen and a chlorine, that's easy. It's got a CH3, so that's a methyl group. And then it has this carbon with two methyls and a hydrogen on it that is effectively an isopropyl group, if you go back to those um, abbreviations that we used back in. Wow, I guess it was the butane um, confirmation discussions. Okay, so here's this carbon written out so that we can see, first of all, very obviously, there are four different things attached to the carbon, and we can shorten it so we get rid of all of the distracting um, vegetation there, the carbon-hydrogen vegetation. Anyway, react this up with hydroxide, and we can get SN2 reaction substituting the OH- minus for the chloride. Okay, and again, let's have a look at um, that molecule in shorthand. Now, anytime we have a chiral carbon, we want to assign the priorities of the groups attached to it, and that will help us do the R and the S. So this carbon here, the original 2-chloro-3-methyl um, um, butane, Chlorine, obviously the top priority here, both isopropyl and methyl are carbons attached to this carbon. The methyl group only has three hydrogens. The isopropyl carbon has two carbons attached to that carbon, so that makes it the second priority. Methyl third priority, of course, hydrogen the fourth priority. And the same priorities here, except we're switching the top priority chlorine for the top priority hydroxide. Okay. Now let's think about the isomers, the enantiomers that we have of the 2-chloro-3-methylbutane. So we can have hydrogen going back because it's always easier when you draw the hydrogen coming back. Let's take the chlorine here in the plane and then we'll switch the isopropyl and the methyl of one isomer for the methyl and the isopropyl of another isomer. Drawing out the pretty pictures here to make it easier. The green is chlorine that is the top priority. Isopropyl is the blue, that's the second priority. Methyl is the purple or pink, and that's the third priority. So we go one, two, three, hydrogen at the back. So going around that way is anti-clockwise. So that makes it the S isomer. And then drawing this one out nicely, again, now the purple methyl on top, instead of the blue isopropyl on top. Hydrogen at the back, count around one, two, three, 
going around like that. That is clockwise. So this is the R enantiomer. Okay, so we've got two possible enantiomers associated with our reactant. Now let's go through the five coordinate in quotes intermediate. Okay, the isopropyl will keep at the top. The chlorine is going to be here leaving. The hydroxide is coming in, attacking. We've got the methyl coming out at you and the hydrogen going away from you. And then afterwards, well, here's the OH has fully come in. Leave the isopropyl there on top, even though, of course, it will go a little bit that way because it was a little bit that way. But anyway, but what's important is now the methyl and the hydrogens were on the left. Now they're on the right. Draw that pretty picture out. Hydrogen at the back. Hydroxide, number one priority. Blue isopropyl, number two priority. Purple methyl, number three priority. Going around clockwise. That's R. So if we start off with S, we only get the R. Now let's see what happens if we start off at R. Again, goes through that five coordinate intermediate, horribly drawn one. But you can again see methyl at the top, isopropyl and the hydrogen here, sort of moving in this direction as the OH comes in, as the chlorine leaves. And we end up with this beautiful little picture. There's the model of it. Hydrogen at the back, hydroxide. First priority, isopropyl second priority, methyl third priority. We're going around anti-clockwise. So that's the S in antima. So we start with S, we end up with R. We start with R, we end up with S. Got to be very careful in how I phrase that. But what's important in this particular example is, as you can see, we've inverted the kind of configuration. What was on the left is now on the right. Okay, And that is a prime evidence that the OH, in this case, the nucleophile more generally, comes in from the backside to push the halogen, in this case, the chlorine, away. Okay, so a couple of extra mechanistic considerations. Hope you enjoyed them. Hope you found them interesting. I will, of course, have some examples of this in the worksheet that's associated with this module.